Let's talk a little bit about VO2 max again yeah. in terms of like what is actually driving it. So let's go through all the variables, right? So right. you've got sort of gas exchange in the lung. In the lung, correct. And then you've got gas exchange in, uh, or sorry, then you have pump efficiency, right? So we, got, we went through the mechanics of that again, but just so people understand what we talk about, you've got stroke volume, contractility, right. of course, afterload and preload and all yep. these things that determine basically the efficacy of the pump to move the medium to the capillary bed. And then you have capillary exchange in the muscle bed. Right. So, so broadly speaking, let's just say those right. are three variables, right? You've got the gas exchange at the source, you've got the pump, and then you've got the gas exchange at the destination. Uh, is that, I know that's overly simplistic. Yeah, it's a way to look at it. So let's just yep. think you got air to lung, yep. lung to blood, blood from the, the, the heart to the tissues, uh, and, and oxygen from the blood to the tissues, right? So there's, there's four or five steps like that, and you enumerated the, you know, the three big ones. And so in general, you know, oxygen uptake is, is cardiac output, how much blood you're pumping per minute, times arterial venous oxygen difference, how much blood you're extracting, or oxygen you're extracting out of the blood. And it turns out that if you look at all the studies and all the people, fit, unfit, trained, untrained, in general, the biggest issue is how, how, how much blood can you pump? And, and so what is that heart rate times stroke volume equation? Where does that leave us? Now, when you train, you get so you can extract more. And if you're at high altitude or if you've got problems with your lungs, maybe the lungs don't work as well. But in general, I like to tell people you cannot extract what has not been delivered. So the key is delivery. Mm. And that's heart rate times stroke volume. And, and interestingly, Peter, as you, I'm sure you've seen, is some of your fittest people actually have slightly lower peak heart rates. And one of the reasons is is because their stroke volume is so so uh, so high. One of the really interesting again experiment of nature patients is or, or subjects is a man called Eskild Ebison, who won gold medals in five Olympics in rowing for for Denmark. Wow. And, and they have serial VO2 max date on him from the time he was eighteen or nineteen until his early forties. And his VO2 max stayed around you know five point six liters per minute, which is quite sure. high. Wow. And he weighed about 70 kilos. So I, I believe he was a lightweight rower. And anyways, uh, but his peak heart rate dropped from about 190 to 150 over that period of time, which all that means is for is that he was able to pump the same amount of blood, but he had to do more with each beat. And and that's an, that's sort of an interesting example. But the, the that, data that's on, an insane on, example, actually. Yeah, yeah. And again, th these are the sorts of things you you, you see. So. So that is really the key. And so, so in other words, in, in the individual as they age, we right. think that the majority of the reduction in VO2 max is coming from cardiac output reduction. But right, and the majority is probably coming from a reduction in peak heart rate, mm -hmm. which can be buffered to some extent if you have a nice compliant ventricle like we talked about. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I'm not quite yet 50 and I am just saddened by the reduction in my peak heart rate. It, it, it is really breaking my heart. I mean, I Mine was never very high anyway, and I don't worry about it, you know, but I'm 63, so I stopped worrying about it. I just, I worry about what my, my, my workload is. Yeah, yeah, no, I just, but it is amazing. I remember thinking like, there will never be a day when yeah. I can't get my heart rate above X. But, but actually, I'll tell you, for yeah. me, it fell quite precipitously in my 20s. So as, right. a, as a teenager, when I was training obscenely hard, in, inappropriately hard, yep. um, a, a heart rate of 200 was, was an Correct. everyday occurrence. There was never a day in high school that my heart rate didn't hit 200 to 205 beats per minute. Right. Um, and then by the time I was in medical school, so 24, 25 yep. years old, all of a sudden it dropped immediately to about 180. It became very difficult to get over 180, which, by the way, was far lower than the 220 minus your age prediction. So, Peter, I was in a st study. I was, I was in two famous studies as a subject. One is this lactate threshold study when I was 19. And then a few years later, I went and was, worked one summer at Washington University in St. Louis, and I stopped training. I had just run, uh, you know, uh, finished my last year of track and field at the University of Arizona. I'd run. 10,000 meters in 3048 and didn't done well on the pack 10s, which was wow. a fast time. Well, I was good enough to get lapped by the world record holders, like what is what I like to tell people. But anyways, um, what happened is my peak heart rate was like 185 or 188. I can't remember. And over the period of 12 weeks of detraining, it went up to about 10 beats a minute. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 it went, which would have been, you know, in the high 190s, which would have been, quote, 220 minus my age uh, at the time. But, but again, and there are all sorts of examples. There's a bunch of data on uh, elite athletes showing that, that some of them have peak heart rates similar to 220 mi minus their age, or, but many are lower than that. And they're like Eskild Evison. There are some people that have been world record holders, Olympic champions that had peak heart rates in the 150s. Yeah, mine's if mine if I hit 170 today, it's a it's a correct. That's, that's yeah, a good that day, doesn't surprise which is me. about 220 minus my age. But you know, my uh, my guess is I'd be hard hard pressed to get to 140. Mm -hmm. I, I I was talking with Lance Armstrong on a on, had him on the podcast <laughs> many uh, actually about maybe about a little less than a year ago actually, and yeah. we were talking about back in the in the heyday of his tours, they weren't really looking at their power meters when they were right. competing, so they trained with a power meter. But when it was when it was race day for the time trial, yeah. you just went off heart rate, and I was just blown away. I mean, so Lance, you got to think Lance was winning the tours between yeah. twenty eight and thirty five, right? He was, he was still holding two hundred beats per minute for the entire for time his heart, trial. yeah, right. So, so imagine and again, forty five just... minutes at two hundred beats per minute when you're thirty plus years old is and kind of and, and on the the other example there would be a man named Bob Shule who is an American who won the five thousand in nineteen sixty four, who did interval training all day and all night. It was incredible how he trained and his peak heart. I have, I have the data someplace was like one fifty four, one fifty six. It's it was not particularly high. Jim Ryan's was not the great miler was not particularly high in his twenties. Yeah, so just incredible stroke volume. Correct, 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 correct. Big heart, big pumps.